Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the latest in our series of lunchtime webinars. My name is Guy Coward, and I'll MC this webinar. I'm here with Henry Louis of ACS and IT Masters CEO and founder Martin Hale. Martin, you should all know from his regular updates on IT generally, and particularly CSU and their course offerings. Henry is the Director of Certifications for ACS, having been with ACS for five years. He's also worked with CompTIA and Nobel, so has plenty of industry certification experience as well. We're here, we're here to speak about uh, a way, at long last, I think, um, to recognise and quantify experience in the IT industry with respect to recognition of prior learning in our courses. Many of you will know that we can grant credit for industry certifications, but it's nice to finally have another way to, to recognise your experience and proficiencies. We'll start with Henry um, going through ACS processes of getting certified and um, then Martin will outline credit that is available as well as why we think a Masters in IT is a good idea. And finally, please feel free to uh, send in questions using the Q&A box or just using the chat. You, know, you can chat amongst yourselves uh, using the chat function of Zoom, which we're using for this meeting. Just remember to set your chat setting to all panellists and attendees so everybody's kept in the loop. If a question is something I can't respond in writing to, um, I'll either leave it for a Q&A session at the end, or if it's particularly relevant, I'll interrupt Martin or Henry. But that's more than enough for me. Uh, please be welcome Martin and Henry in the chat. Thanks for joining us, folks. Great. Thanks very much, Guy. And good afternoon, um, everybody on, online, and um, good morning for those that are actually joining us from the, uh, the Western States. Um, Western states, Western state, um, unless there's something's actually changed between now and, um, and this call. Um, thank you so much. I'm Henry. I'm the Director of Professional Certifications for the ACS. Um, an agenda within the agenda. So um, as Guy had already put up, um, just a quick run through of what we'll be covering off in this half hour. I wanted to cover off, um, you know, the concept we've all heard of, which is, you know, the knowledge versus skills versus experience and how that relates to ACS certification. Also, too, around establishing a benchmark of how ACS actually accredits or, or, or assesses its certifications. That's a question that I've had quite a lot before we even came onto this call, and it's actually one of the reasons and the drivers for this actual webinar. Um, we'll talk about ACS certification itself and what it entails, and probably more important, what documentation and evidence you need to, um, uh, to produce and to um, um, create to, um, in order to actually um, come into an assessment. We also talk about why we should be um, certified with ACS um, and also some time for Q&A, but I believe that we'll probably hold off the questions and answers towards the end, um, unless um, Guy actually pops up and, and has a, a, there's a relevant question that comes up from a lot of people and we'll answer it at the time. So Guy, they can ask questions by the chat. Yeah, so you can send it in via the chat or by the, by the Q&A box. I'm looking at both right now, so um, any that come through, we'll, we'll assess. Fantastic, thanks Guy. So, um, as Guy mentioned, um, previously before joining the ACS, I was Regional Director for CompTIA. So some of the people on this call might know CompTIA from their foundations-based certifications around security with the Security Plus PC hardware and software with, uh, with the A Plus networking through Network Plus, et cetera. Um, and before then, I was um, a Nobel Education Manager for Asia Pacific, um, and we and you know, it had a range of certifications from the CNE, CNA uh, and onwards. The challenge with a lot of certifications, um, and I'm not saying all, but the challenge with a lot of certifications is that certifications are generally based on knowledge-based examinations. So we go to a Pearson View testing site or Sylvan Pro Metric in those days. Um, you sit through, do your multiple choice or maybe scenario-based questions and you come out with a result. Um, that's fantastic because it's a really great way of actually uh, assessing your knowledge, but doesn't necessarily give you an indication of actually how you're applying that knowledge within a workforce. So someone might have a certification on Cisco, but doesn't tell us whether they're actually building Cisco networks or just managing um, um, Cisco environments or non-Cisco environments for that matter. So the ACS and what we look at is an assessment based on not just your knowledge, but also looking at how, uh, what skills you have, as well as actually the experience on how you're actually applying those skills as a level of responsibility. So when we talk about responsibility and we're talking about benchmarking, 
in ACS, we use an international framework called the Skills Framework for the Information Age. Um, a lot of people know this colloquially as SOFIA, as in Sophia Loren. Um, so there's a silent O in there. So SFIA, uh, what it is, is it's a globally accepted, um, or it's a, it's a globally accepted common language for skills and competencies within the digital world. It's been in operation for just under 20 years. So it actually was first introduced in 2000. Um, by an international consortium based out of the United Kingdom. We've had seven um, releases of the SOFIA framework, and in fact, we're actually taking submissions at the moment for version eight. So it's always continuously actually being updated. And the last um, uh, version of SOFIA that came out was um, version seven, which was published in June of 2018. The important thing about the governance of it is that it's a foundation based on its own user base. So in Australia, we actually have a couple of industry representations on the SOFIA Council, um, and it's their uh, observations from the customers, from the users, that actually gets fed through to the SOFIA Council to look at the review um, and I suppose the validity of the, of the skills framework. So that's what we use in ACS, and it's the cornerstone of what we use for, for our certifications. Oh, how did that next slide? How come I can't go to the next slide? Well, technical. Just a technical glitch at the moment. Uh, there you go. Thank you. So, um, and this is not a um, this is not a webinar about Sophia, but just very quickly. Um, and you know, you uh, you don't have perfect eyesight, so I'm not expecting you to actually look at each of that that slide there. But in very simple terms. So FIA uh, lists 102 skills that someone working in IT potentially can possess. So if you're working in service management, there are tools, uh, there are skills, for example, like customer service support, network support, um, uh, problem, incident management, etc. If you work in as an architect, we have solution architecture, we have enterprise architecture, we have uh, business analysis, we have technology specialism. So we have a whole range of skills that can be mapped and identified and, uh, and described within the skills framework. And those skills themselves are actually broken up into six major categories from solution architecture, change and transformation, development, implementation, delivery and operation, which is typically your IT service management, skills and quality. So um, the lecturers, um, trainers, et cetera, are out there, the quality assurance managers, um, as well as relationship and engagement. So the skills themselves, 102 skills, broken up into seven levels of responsibility. So what does, the, the, what does responsibility mean? So the way SOFIA works is that uh, you could have one or more of the 102 skills that um, align to the skills framework within your job role. And we generally find on average, anyone, um, people have anywhere between four to 12 skills that you generally find are aligned to the skills framework. Of those, we then look at actually how you actually apply those skills as a level of responsibility. So, um, in a very simple case, um, level one, which what, what I tend to call the work experience level, is what we call follow. So if someone has a skill of follow, it's really about working in a very procedural type of environment, um, very little autonomy, um, and very uh, little v variation of the work that you actually do. And when I say work experience, if you think back to when we were all in work experience, the work that we got assigned was very monkey see, monkey do, as an example. Right through to level seven, which is to set strategy and inspire and mobilize the workforce. So you generally find the type of skills that you have there would be organizational wide. As an example, um, IT, um, um, IT strategy and planning or information strategy, that if someone has that skill at level seven, then they generally would be the person that would be responsible for information strategy for the organization. Um, at level six would be someone that might, might have information um, um, strategy for their uh, business unit and so forth. So it's really about applying the skill that you have against the level of responsibility that actually has been benchmarked by, um, by, by Sophia. So 
in relation to that and how we apply it. So from ACS certification, the ACS certification itself provides recognition, the same recognition afforded to um, professional disciplines such as accounting, engineering and law. So the CP, the certified professional, is recognised by Professions Australia and also grants the holder uh, uh, access into the, Australia, the ACS professional standards scheme. There's a whole range of benefits in relation to actually having that, but probably the two major ones for me is the actual recognition of yourself as a profession, as a professional, also to the capped uh, limited liability um, of insurance on those rare instances where um, there might be a, a judgment made against an individual, uh, liability is actually capped at $2 million for people under the PSS. Um, and that's a, that's a benefit and one of the major benefits of actually being uh, um, certified with the ACS. So from a certification standpoint, we have two certifications. Um, one is a certified technologist, and that is a certification for those that exit the assessment that have been validated or assessed to be working at SOFIA level three or four. Um, and that is the benchmark for our certified technologist. A certified professional are those that um, are on assessment have their, their, um, their skills aligned as a level of responsibility to levels five, six, or seven. So simple terms, if you have three or four, you're, you're, you, you have potential to be a certified technologist. If you have five or higher, then you have the potential to be a certified professional. So the next question is, then what else do I need to have besides actually being working at a, a level three or a level five? So it's based on Sophia, a candidate's assessed against um, well, three major things. One is the SOFIA level of responsibility that they generally work at in their day-to-day -day job role. Um, against one or more SOFIA technical skills. So if you happen to have, for example, um, testing as an, as an example, then um, being a software tester, are you responsible for writing the master test plan? That would be a, a good example or a good indicator that you're actually working in that SOFIA level five. If you are only doing UAT testing, then that, that would be a good indicator that you're typically working at a, a level a little bit lower than that. So just some, 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 some examples of actually how we actually apply it from an assessment standpoint. Um, also two over an, a minimum duration. So Martin and I were talking about this earlier. It's like going to an accountant and asking, well, you know, um, thanks for doing my tax return. Um, just out of interest, how many tax returns have you actually completed or done? And the accountant looks at you and go, well, including yours, Henry, one. So you don't, boom, boom, you don't really want to be the first. So we're also looking at not just whether you actually have the skill and the level of responsibility, but the actual experience to actually back your, um, um, uh, back your experience working with that particular skill. You adhere to the ACS Code of Ethics, um, uh, which I did cover and I did actually have on the slide, but just because of clarity, I just I, I can um, I can send it to for people that are interested in that. It's actually on our ACS website. A candidate possesses a breadth of ICT knowledge. So we in ACS use, and you've probably heard the term T-shaped skills. When we talk about technical proficiencies, we're generally talking about um, your knowledge um, in the vertical of a, a, a T. So that's really your networking skills, your programming skills, your um, your problem management skills, your, your your consultancy skills. But to be a good all-round IT professional, we also like that individual to actually have a, a strong breadth of ICT knowledge. And so that's where we use what's called the ACS core body of knowledge. And the core body of knowledge looks at 20 knowledge areas that an ICT professional should have knowledge of. So that's if you are a programmer, having good understanding of the role of the, the P of the, of the project managers or the business analysts or the database administrators. Not that you will actually be doing those work, but you have an empathy and understanding of their job role in order to give you better grounding and overall application of, of, of your work on to assist you. Uh, and also I've worked in the ICT industry for a minimum number of years, and that's actually based on the candidate assessment pathway. So in other words, and this is actually going to be talked about in the next couple of slides, but if someone has an ICT degree that's accredited um, 
by an Australia, um, of that's, an, that's an ACS accredited uh, qualification, the number of years that an individual needs to have from an experience perspective is shorter than someone that, for example, only has a vendor certification or is someone has industry experience only. And by the way, we have pretty much all, we, we get applications weekly from everyone that fits in that area. They've, they've got IT degrees, um, they, come, they have non-ICT degrees, they've got vendor certifications, or increasingly, they've, they've learned their IT through osmosis. And I'm sure there's actually people who are on this webinar right now that's putting their hands up and going, that's me. Uh, I've, I've actually don't have any formal qualifications or certifications. We can actually assess you and certify you. Yeah. So um, there's two pathways. This is the, the certified technologist pathway chart. Um, I know it's a bit small, but it's actually on the ACS website. On the left hand side just talks about the highest level of qualification an individual um, uh, um, has attained, then looks at um, the number of years of industry experience that they need to have against the SOFIA skills um, and, that will, uh, and then how many years of experience you need to actually work on that particular skill itself. I know it's quite small, but in general terms, on the top, if you have an ICT degree that's accredited by the ACS, you only need one year of experience to, to, to apply with one year of that working at SOFIA level three and as, as it goes down. The CP is very similar again, except that the years of experience actually um, goes a little bit higher. So for an ICT degree that's accredited by the ACS, it's three years of ICT industry experience. Two years of that has to be working at SOFIA level five, as an example, and so forth. As I said, um, um, you know, we don't want people squinting at the screen, et cetera, but this is actually available on the ACS website for you to download. But the full pathway charts for both the CT uh, and CP, as well as our, our two specialisms on cybersecurity, are available for you to download and to, and, and to review. So what's, what's, what's required? So just the last, um, last, um, last slide. Um, from an individual perspective, we need an updated uh, CV. We uh, require two referees or who are champions for your, um, and can talk about your experience as well as your responsibilities. Uh, if, if you require education in respect to um, degrees or vendor certifications, et cetera, then we need um, certified copies. For those that actually have e-qualifications, um, a link to your e-qual link would, 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 be a, would, 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 uh, would also be applicable. Um, certified copies of your TAFE qualifications, uh, again, if relevant, um, and any vendor certifications. For those with online validation, just a link to the online validation link would be great. If not, again, certified copies would be required. And generally, we will only look at um, um, certifications which have uh, five years of recent currency. So if you did your ITOOL V1 course back in the mid 2000s, probably can't use that towards um, um, applying for your certification. We'd ideally like a more current ITOOL certification as such. And to apply, um, it's the ACS website, acs.org.au, click on professional development and click on um, um, certifications and that will actually take you to the link for the certification page, which allows you to actually uh, um, apply online. If you have any questions on, before I hand over to Martin, I think my contact details are actually on this link as well as, um, as, as, long as, as, well as on this webinar. So feel free to email me if you have any questions about, uh, about the certification and what it entails and I'll hand over to Martin. Uh, just a question we often get, Henry, is from prospective master students as how much credit they might be eligible for, yeah. rather than then produce all the documentation that's required. Is it uh, feasible for them to send a brief resume of what their background is and say, and get a type of a feeler to say, yeah, I think you're going to come in at a technologist level? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and this is actually a very common, great question, Martin. We get this all the time. So it's uh, free of charge. So if uh, people look, uh, are not concerned, but it's actually uh, are interested in actually where they believe that their certification outcome will be, send through your CV. Um, we will actually send it to our senior assessors. It's a free review and they will give a, um, a, a, a judgment call on, on, on where they believe that certification is. Now, it's not a fait accompli uh, because you'd still need to meet some other requirements, et cetera, but we can give you an indication of where you believe your outcome will be. I'm glad that was the answer because if you had then said that's not possible, it would have been a bit flat, but we did all right. That was good. Thank you, Henry. And by the way, I said 15 minutes. You were 21, so there's a slap on the head for Henry. Sorry. Um, 
Okay, let's get to the masters. The credit set up for the ACS certification is two tiers. Uh, we do this with a number of other certifications, a vendor certification, so it fits in pretty well. Um, obviously, the lower level one, the technologist cert, uh, which was level three, Sophia? Level three, yeah. Uh, which is more the doer type, you know, the technologist, the doer, uh, is one subject of unspecified credit, and I'll explain how that works in a minute. And if you get to the next level, Sophia level five, um, you would get two subjects of credit. You don't get three if you've got both, I'm sorry. Um, it's a maximum of two. And as you saw, there was some different ACS professional certs. There's one in cybersecurity and one in... Safety critical systems. Safety. It's still a maximum of two. That's the way the uni set it. But even that's pretty attractive because the master's degree is only 12 subjects in total. So not only have you saved yourself the cost, which I'll show you in a minute, but you've also saved yourself the time, which in a lot of cases, people, it's more important to people. Um, Again, I took a leaf out of Henry's book, nice small writing that you can't read. Um, but there's a, it's up on our website, you can click through. But they qualify for credit across all of the, how many masters is it, guys? Is it eight or seven? That's seven. Seven masters that we offer. Uh, the only one that's not is the Master of Applied Digital Marketing. But who knows in the future, there's some things going on there. We may include that going forward. But certainly th those seven are available uh, for your credit. So you can get credit at any time. You can get credit the minute before you, or not the minute, the, a couple of months before you end up graduating, or you can get it before you actually start your master's and have it approved uh, as you start and any time in between. So um, again, as I said before, professional certifications get you two subjects of unspecified credit and the technologist gets you one. How does that work? Well, it's the best way to do it is have a look at a recent, very recent K, case study. Jay, how do you pronounce it, Henry? Any, uh, Jay? Wazenko? Jawenko, we think. Um, lovely <laughs> sorry, guy from... Sorry, Jay. Jay's actually here. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Jay. <laughs> um, well, I was just, I was going to say this anyway, Jay, a lovely guy from, but my God, what uh, incredible knowledge. Um, and Jay was one of the hundreds of applicants who was interested in doing the masters. And I said, Jay, if I had my way, I would be giving you credit because you've got an amazing background. But the trouble is the uni can't just give people credit. Uh, they've got to have a way of quantifying and hence why we're so excited about the ACS certification. So Jay went off and um, got his certification, Henry, is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Um, and what level did he end up? Uh, so, so Jay was successful in um, receiving his, um, obtaining the certified professional. One thing that we didn't talk about because it actually wasn't relevant for this webinar, but part of the assessment is the assessors will also look at your membership grading, which is part of ACS. So Jay's outcome was a certified professional, but also um, attained the ranks of senior member of the ACS as well. So um, made, um, um, made a membership jump of actually two as part of the assessment process. And some of his team applied as well? They are, yeah, they're actually, um, so um, Jay's um, got a number of, of his team actually also applied for certification and they're currently actually in the assessment process right now. Okay. Um, Hopefully we'll see a few in the Masters, that'd be great. Uh, is, Jay's commencing in November, the next uh, intake. And because he's been classified in an ACS certified cyber, he would be up for two subjects of unspecified credit. Well, how does that work? Well, Jay's the Master of Cybersecurity, there it is there, it's 12 subjects. He doesn't get a qualifier for credit for any of the core, even though I think, I suspect he might be able to run one or two of those subjects himself, and who knows in the future, we're hoping he will do that. Um, so, uh, but it is core, so the core he would do, uh, but electives which you'd normally have to do four, he will only have to do two. That's right, Guy, isn't it? That's your understanding? Just two electives required? Yes, if he gets the two unspecified credits, there's only two more electives to go. Yep, so you pick and choose two from there. Unfortunately, you have to miss out on some of those wonderful subjects there. But uh, um, we also received credit, I believe there's another credit there for uh, one of his industry, he had an industry certification as well. So he, he would be up for just nine subjects, which I say, uh, will cut the cost, probably not such a big issue to Jay, um, but also will cut the time, which I suspect would be more of an inch, um, more attractive. What's the return on investment? Um, okay, well, 
the ACS certification and membership cost, uh, you need to be both. You need to be an ACS member and you to apply for certification. That's uh, on the website when you go up there. So there's two costs there. Um, which is the certification cost, Henry? The certification is the 346.50. Yep. Is it 50 for you or? <laughs> it's actually, and the reason why people ask about the 50 is actually, um, that's the in inclusive GST. Oh, so okay. it's actually $315 um, X GST. The government always gets a, a little bit in there. And plus the yearly uh, ACS membership will cost, which is 374. Yeah. Um, cost of a subject uh, in all of those masks is 3250. So if you do the math, and I, I did pull up Excel to do this, I don't trust myself anymore to, um, and plug in all the numbers, um, your, your total saving would be 577950, um, plus obviously at least a whole session of study time that you wouldn't have to do before you graduate. So um, pretty attractive option that way. And especially if you can get a, a, a preliminary evaluation to see whether it's worth going through the process, um. And by the way, Martin, um, a lot of people ask this question. So our ACS membership being a membership, it, the, it, the yearly fee of, um, of $374, but the certification is a one-off fee. So once you're certified, as long as you actually meet your continuing professional development hours, you will remain certified with the ACS. Oh, I haven't been that in. So PD, what's what's the requirement? So professional you? development, for a certified technologist, it's 20 hours of, of continuing professional development. So that would be, for example, attending any industry events, internal training within the organisation, um, Gartner, uh, the Microsoft Tech Ed conference. Or not doing tech their ed, masters. Yeah, doing their masters, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Doing their masters. So, in fact, you could, yeah, you can actually have your cake and eat it too. Actually, yes. as a master's, and apply that to your CPD. Um, okay, so if you're interested in applying about that, we've got our pre preliminary assessment like the ACS, but ours covers everything. Um, not only the ACS, you can put the ACS in, then obviously the next step would be go and get that a, uh, a further indication on that. But um, we offer credit for previous studies at postgraduate level, providing they're relevant. And we also offer credit for industry vendor certification, all the mainstream ones, and a few that are not mainstream, we offer credit. Uh, all you want to, you want to do if you want to find that out is go to the IT Masters, well, just put into Google IT Masters eligibility, and that form will come up. Uh, we get several thousand of these a year, people putting in and just uh, seeing what type of credit they would be up for. So um, just fill it out and it'll give you two things. It'll give you, we'll come back to you with an indication of how much credit you should be up for. And secondly, we confirm that you would actually be eligible to get into the Masters or, or the graduate certificate. Um, so that's a definite first next step. Um, I, Guy also mentioned I was going to cover um, what's the return on doing your masters, which I forgot to put in there, Guy. Oh, okay. But there's another presentation on that, and um, it shows how much more people, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, um, people with degrees and particularly masters degrees are earning and. All I can say it's one of the best investments you'd ever make in terms of uh, earnings over your career. Um, that's up on our website if you want to have a look at just go on the fees and payment at the IT Masters and there's a, a, a brief presentation on that. But I can also send the, the link around with the slides and the recording as well so we'll, we'll give you that. Okay. When, after the webinar we'll send around the recording and slides and, and all sorts of additional information so you can go through that in your own time. Excellent. But we do have some Q, some questions to answer. Um, thanks for sending them in, folks. We've got about uh, six or seven. Um, I'll start with a simple one. Um, Imran has asked about the Sophia. I recently had a Sophia assessment around a year ago. Do I need to do another one? Um, it's so, Imran, if it's a formal skills assessment, uh, then talk to me offline. We could probably um, use those towards your actual uh, um, ACS certification assessment. Um, Okay, yeah, there's a few, if you do have a, a case where you think you might not quite fit into the, the boxes that we've laid out for you, feel free to get in touch with us. You'll have all of our contact details uh, after this webinar. And yeah, we can always try and negotiate differences. Um, Phil has asked, and Phil is someone I've been talking to and trying to get into the masters for almost two years now. How far back does the work experience count for the assessment? 
as usually you put 10 years into the CV. Uh, and Bill, just on a personal note, I hope you're having a nice time still traveling around Australia. Right. <laughs> Does Phil know me, I wonder? Anyway, <laughs> so uh, in relation to the work experience, um, we it's, it's anything over 10 years, uh, we, but you can basically stop at 10 years if you uh, if you don't want to actually go back on your CV that much because that's enough for an experience only pathway. But in relation to assessment, and this is actually a really uh, important point, um, if you, for example, were an IT manager back in the early 2000s and have had a career change and um, now working in the service desk, then we wouldn't be looking at your highest level of skill. It's really around the relevancy and the um, uh, the currency within the skill that we're actually looking at itself. So to go back or to, to summarise, uh, the CV needs to demonstrate enough experience in order to meet your pathway, but we assess you based on the currency of the skill that you actually have. Yep. Right. Martin, one for you. Um, this one's from Peter. With the ACS technology certification, or indeed any of them, can you apply it as an industry cert that counts towards your specialisation, for example, in project management, uh, the Masters of Management. What do you think, Bob? You're pretty good on this stuff. Yeah, with, with credit, I think yes. The only thing, if you are certified professional, that would be two industry credits, yeah. and sometimes that can affect your specialisations if you claim more than one. One is certainly not an issue, assuming you haven't had any other credits um, awarded. Um, but in all instances, it's probably best just to fill out that eligibility form and have a chat with me because I'll probably be getting in touch with you or Neil McCosh from IT Masters who's been around and has all of the um, credit information in the in his head. Um, so it's, it's, it's a possibility, but there might be some complications. And, and again, you can probably try and negotiate some course amendments if necessary. Uh, a question about, ah, this one's from Jamie here. What if I spend 20 years working for myself and have no official qualifications from, for example, Cisco or Microsoft? Been a small business all the time and I like it that way, working for myself. So I don't have any certifications and only experience. So, so that's a, a, a nice comment from Jamie because I think that's the beauty of this presentation and this, this situation. We've finally found a way for people like you, Jamie, to find some recognition of the effort that you've already put in for such a long time. Um, previously, we find it really difficult to recognize your prior learning or you have to be on the hook for if you're maybe interested in early doing a grad cert, doing four subjects. Now, potentially, just by becoming an ACS member and getting this uh, assessment done, you could only need to do two subjects, which can be achieved in as little as three months if you do it in one study session. So, so that's the perfect test. I think that's the perfect test case for something like this. Yeah, and to, to go back to that, Jamie, um, uh, we get a, a number of, of, of applications in your in your situation where um, they run their own business, um, self starter or consultant. Um, our assessors are, are very familiar with with with, um, with those type of job roles and, and the assessment that that's required for them. Shun Pali has asked. I believe the maximum amount of credits you can get on a on a course with us is fifty percent or six on a master's. Is there any possible way to increase the number based on individual's assessment, Martin? Uh, thank you for the question. That's a, uh, no, in, in a short answer. Um, the minimum amount uh, by uh, Charles Sturt University regulations that you have to do in any course to get that qualification is 50%. So uh, we've had many people asked about this over the years, but um, it's that's the maximum credit available. Yeah. Nice try, though. Pretty good. Um, Anchor's asked, how is this certification, or how, did, how does this certification compare to Cisco certification, for example? So it, it doesn't compete. So again, um, we actually um, we find that a lot of people that actually uh, uh, that apply for certification actually apply with Cisco certifications as part of their documentation pack. And go back to, again is that from Cisco, Microsoft, um, a range of vendors is that having the certification itself doesn't really give an employer uh, the um, any indication of actually how you're applying those skills. So what we look at is that, hey, you've got your Cisco certification. What the ACS certification does is it talks about how you're actually applying it as a level of responsibility. So they're not competing, they're actually complementing each other really well. Yeah, Henry shared the numbers with me before, which I won't uh, share with you now, but they're very impressive, the number they're doing the certification. As an employer myself, and I've employed IT people, I must admit a competency-based assessment like that I would be interested in because 
I think vendor certification is fantastic, but sometimes it just means they can pass the exam, truthfully. Sometimes, I'm not saying all the time, but it does happen at different times. Uh, uh, the Australian Institute of Project Management, for instance, has a competency-based um, certification, Reg PM. And, you know, you watch the people going through it and they know their stuff. They watch them on, the, you know, they actually see that they can actually do the stuff. So I'd be interested, at least as an employer, that's, I, I would, um, in having a look at it. Uh, question from Jason, is there an email for the CV uh, for the, oh, sorry, is, it, is there an ACS email to get a, a, an indication that we should send it to or is it just send it to you? Oh, yes, you can send it to me directly. So it's um, henry.louis or henry, H-E-N-R-Y dot louis, L-O-U-E-Y at acs.org.au. But I think this is actually going to be included as part of the, the pack anyway. Yeah, we'll send okay. it uh, and, and maybe just a couple more questions. Um, conscious of us running over time. Lynn's asked, can I apply the assessment credits at grad cert level? Yes, um, provided it fits within your course structure uh, and, and the requirement for it to be for industry electives. It may only qualify you for one credit, I should warn you there, because there is a restricted electives. So just be, but the easiest way, put that in that eligibility form, put what you're interested in, and we'll come back and give you the advice. You know, even though you haven't got the ACS certification, put it in there and we'll say, well, that's what it would get you if you've got it. So check beforehand, definitely. All right. There's one last question, maybe not particularly relevant to exactly what we've been talking, but maybe an interesting talking point. I think we'll finish it on that one. This is from Matthew. How up to date is the CBOC? Thinking on lines of newer technology such as cloud, containers, Kubernetes, big data, Internet of Things, etc. Um, that's actually a really good question. Um, the CBOC was ratified in 2017, but I, um, I need to speak to other areas of ACS. I do know they're actually always in constant review, like everything we do with the products and services suite with ACS. Um, but if you're interested in what actually the CBOC actually covers, I can actually send you out, out of the, the CBOC for your review. And we're also we're always welcome any, uh, any feedback and actually what needs to be maybe re looked after or looked into to um, uh, or as, as part of future enhancements. And Sophia, how up to date is that thing? Uh, Sophia was uh, last year, June 2018. Okay, yeah. so it'd be interesting to have a look at cloud and stuff like that to see, because it's evolving so rapidly, to see um, how well it's covered in it. That's right, and one of the great things is that ACS actually is part of the Sophia Council. Yep. So um, your feedback is all fed back through the Sophia Council for continuous improvement with the Sophia framework. I mean, there would be hundreds of organisations on it, the Sophia? Or? Yeah. It's yeah. a global. Yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, um, A and Z, I think we punch above our weight. So, and I, this is it's not relevant to this, um, um, to this call, but a number of large federal government, state, um, and even commercial organisations all, 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 all use Sophia in some capacity, um, including some very, very large banks. Yeah. yeah, so if you're an IT manager out there, it's really definitely worth a look at, sort of framework for your staff. Um, yeah, it's complicated when you first look at it, but it's got to be. There's a lot to it. But um, it's, it's what a framework to, to evaluate and, and to work out what level your people are working at. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I guess all that's left to do is thank everyone for attending. Um, hopefully you've got a lot out of it. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to get in touch and, and rest assured we'll send you as much information as we possibly can fit into one email pretty shortly. Um, thank you, Martin, of course, as always. Uh, and thank you, Henry, for joining us for this webinar. Have a lovely day and, and talk to you all soon. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you so much.